So, um, Nathaniel, I'm Robbie. We're going to talk about how to conquer the world of Kerberos. Um, so, before we do that, though, um, this is a tag team talk. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, then Nathaniel's going to talk a little bit, um, and then I was going to talk a little bit at the end. Um, and then we'll leave a good chunk of time at the end for questions, hopefully. Does everybody in the room know what Kerberos is? Does anybody not know? Got it. Okay, cool. Um, so you know what Kerberos is, but you probably don't know who Kerberos is. Kerberos is this guy. Um, he is our three-headed protector of secrets, guardian of the underworld. Very importantly, he is fuzzy and squishy, um, and each of the heads have individual names and need to be respected as individual persons. Okay. And you, you forgot to tell us where we can buy the plushie. I have no idea where you can buy the plushie. I'm sorry. <laughs> but Dimitri, we need those for the team. It's, it's, it's like essential it's business for the team. Go for it. Then. Okay. So, uh, as Robbie said, my name is Nathaniel, uh, and Robbie and I both work on the Kerberos and Identity Management teams at Red Hat. And uh, this is actually a uh, expanded version of a talk that I gave at DevConf, a lightning talk, <coughs> and we've combined our two relative areas of expertise, so hopefully uh, we can be beneficial to you today. Uh, let's f first start off by looking at Kerberos the past. Um, Kerberos has had a pretty long past, and uh, it was obviously there was version four, well there was version before that as well, but uh, version four was the big one that was kind of first deployed, and then uh, version 5 blew up from there. Lots of people have deployed it. It's a true single sign-on system, unlike a lot of uh, people that throw around the word single sign-on. What they mean is you're using the same credentials everywhere, which usually you're not. But uh, In Kerberos, you actually have a true single sign-on experience uh, where you log in one time, uh, and then for each additional login, you just get uh, tickets that prove your previous login, so you don't have to continue to type your credentials every time you log in somewhere. Uh, Kerberos has a, another really, really important feature, which is that the credentials don't go on a wire. So uh, in most of your authentication systems, uh, you will very often see people setting up things like SSL tunnels because they want to send passwords in the clear, but they want to encrypt them inside this tunnel to keep them safe, uh, which of course, if the tunnel is compromised, but for any reason, now everyone's reading all the passwords, uh, which is uh, a very bad thing. So Kerberos was actually designed uh, from the get-go to be a cryptographic system in which the credentials were never sent over the wire. And what this means is that it can be deployed completely without an SSL tunnel on an untrusted network. And the, the end result is a very secure system. Uh, and this was widely deployed. There's lots of implementations of Kerberos. Uh, MIT KRB5 is the primary one that we deal with, uh, and it's the primary one that is used uh, in Fedora. <coughs> but there's also a, uh, several other implementations. Heimdall is another open source one uh, that, that has largely been used in the Samba project, although my understanding is that they're moving mm -hmm. from that. Yeah. Um, are, they going to Kirk, are they going to Kirk 5? They're going to okay. Kirk 5. MIT? Okay. And uh, so Microsoft is probably the widest deployed of all of these. Uh, Kerberos uh, is the backbone of the Active Directory infrastructure. So if you're using Active Directory anywhere, uh, or have seen it used, that's only using Kerberos under the covers. Uh, Samba, of course, as mentioned, uh, it uses the Heimdall implementation uh, to provide their Kerberos Active Directory support. So it's used widely by millions of people, it's a trusted system, it's true single sign-on, and uh, no credentials go on the, on the wire. So why in the world isn't everyone using Kerberos? Well, there are some downsides, or at least there were in the past. Uh, the first downside is that it's blocked by firewalls. So there's a lot of system admins that'll just shut off all, all the ports, uh, only opens the open the ones that they want, and uh, so Kerberos can't get through. And this is this is has been a problem traditionally. Uh, a second one is that client configuration is required. So unlike Facebook, you type in Facebook and get a login prompt, and you just type in your credentials, and you're done. You didn't have to configure anything on your system. It just all worked automatically. Uh, Kerberos did not used to work like this. Uh, you actually had to set up in a configuration file the, uh, you know, where you're gonna go to the KDC to get uh, your credentials and all those various other things. And so client configuration was required, which was a, a barrier to adoption. Another downside was client time synchronization. Uh, the initial implementations of Kerberos used a pre-authentication method, uh, which depended on encrypting a timestamp 
And so this meant that the server time and the client time had to be the same, uh, which of course, if you've ever been in an infrastructure, you know that all these systems are not necessarily the same in terms of their clock. Uh, and so this was a pain point uh, historically that uh, you had to have all the clocks synchronized in your infrastructure, otherwise Kerberos just wouldn't work. Uh, the last one uh, th that was a big downside was you could only have one client principal, uh, which means that uh, you could only have one login basically in the system globally. And so you know, if you wanted to have multiple accounts, if you were a contractor and you were working from multiple places, uh, Kerberos would be very painful because you could only have one principal, which meant you'd usually have to swap out that client configuration and, and do things with files to make it work, but it was just really ugly. And so these are all the, the upsides and the downsides here of Kerberos in the past. But fortunately, we've done a lot of work. And so things are, are rather quite different uh, today. Can I ask a question? Yes. One thing I didn't see as a downside was Kerberos interoperability. Okay. Generally, my really good. Pardon? It's generally really good. It, okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's I remember pretty there was a time when MS or Microsoft Kerberos was a little bit different. Oh, from BCE Kerberos. Yeah, yeah. So the interoperability works pretty well these days. Uh, we actually have, there's MIT runs the Kerberos Consortium, uh, which every year has an interoperability meeting uh, in which the different implementations come together and test to make sure that everything's working. As well as Microsoft. So yeah. Two or three events each year that allow you to do that. Two or three events. The big problem was Microsoft had an undocumented extension. Yes. That, that's been done for And it's it's years. it's been documented and done for a long time yeah. now. So yeah. For about six years. Yeah. So at the present, uh, all of the stuff that's here is stuff that has been done in the in the fairly recent present in the last uh, I've been at Red Hat for uh, almost five years now. So all of this stuff is five years or newer. <coughs> Uh, so the first thing we have is, is well, I guess KDC Discovery is older. Uh, we have KDC Discovery, and one of, the, one of the nice things about this is that this actually allows you to, uh, from the principal name, determine which KDC to contact to get that information. And most of the other uh, configuration doesn't really matter that much, so, uh, or it can be handled in different ways. And so with KDC Discovery, it allows us to, uh, to actually discover, just from typing K in it in your principal, you can figure out who to talk to, which completely minimizes the client-side configuration required. Uh, another feature that we've implemented recently was uh, the client time offsets. So the way that this works is that uh, when an authentication fails because of the time, the time synchronization issue, the server actually will reply back and say, uh, it failed, uh, but this is my time. And the client can now do an offset uh, from that time and send back a request knowing that the server has a different and so, uh, so this actually allows you to, uh, to bypass the time synchronization problem, which is one of the larger deployment problems. So that's no longer an issue. Uh, we actually have an even better solution for this, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, but, but even as of today, uh, th this is not a problem. So we've also implemented multiple credential caches, which means now you can have multiple principles uh, on a single system. Uh, so you can log into five different sites if you want to have principles for all of them swapped back and forth between them. Uh, all of this is, is eminently doable today. Uh, we've also developed, uh, this is fairly recent, uh, the HTTPS proxy. Uh, you can see the URL for the upstream project there. And what this actually allows you to do, Microsoft released a standard called KKDCP, uh, which allows you to send Kerberos pro, uh, pro, pro, uh, excuse me, packets across uh, HTTPS. <coughs> and so you can proxy them over web server. This allows you to get past all the ports, right? Because you can just send it to, to 443 uh, to, a, to a proxy and you can get past it that way. So now we don't have the port problem so much. We've also implemented one-time password support and uh, we were the first ones to do this for Kerberos. Uh, so you can see the upstream project here at MIT and you can see the design uh, page for the feature at Free IPA here. And the way the one-time password works is it uses the standard HTTP and TOTP algorithms that uh, are actually internet drafts, RFCs, so they're standardized. Uh, and we use this. And you can do really innovative things. If you're using the free IPA directly, that's what we support. Uh, you can also proxy the OTP to a third-party radius server. This is for support for things like RSA. 
we have all the RSA tokens, that all works now. And uh, we also developed a, a, this is a separate app called Freedom TP, which is available in the Android and iOS uh, stores. And uh, this implements the standard protocol. It's basically the same as the Google Authenticator app, if you've seen it. Uh, but our app right there is open source. It's actively maintained, unlike Google Authenticator. And uh, we're actually developing innovative new features. Uh, <coughs> one of the upcoming cool features is Bluetooth sharing, which will enable you to just send the token code directly to the computer, uh, rather than having to read it off the screen and type it manually. So there's cool things like that going on. Uh, but this is all happening within the, within the Kerberos realm. So this is all stuff that's done. We're also actively working on some new features. Um, probably one of the more important ones is the CAMAC and authentication indicators. This actually just landed last week uh, and will be in Fedora 23. <clears throat> so what the uh, CAMAC and authentication indicators do is that they're signed assertions about authentication. So uh, basically it's a string in the ticket that when you receive a ticket, you can analyze these, these strings, these authentication indicators, and they, they describe what happened uh, when the ticket, uh, or when the authentication occurred. So what this allows you to do is, for example, if you're using the OTP support, we can stick a string now in the ticket that says OTP. And so you can validate that when you receive a ticket, did this user authenticate with OTP or not? So this allows some really uh, neat bridgings, uh, First of all, we plan to implement a policy layer for this uh, in free IPA and then hopefully the next release. It's scheduled for the next release, right? Depends on who we plan. If we, yeah, if we, <laughs> if we can make it, uh, we're going we're gonna to put a layer into IPA to do this, uh, which will basically allow you to say things like, uh, I want two-factor authentication for these services, but not for these services. And then we will approve or deny a ticket based upon your authentication. Uh, what's that? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, one of the... Uh, it will. So the challenge right now. is uh, to have an error code. So the error code can be issued on the server side, but the client side would know and it will be a intent to copy this error code. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure. So there's a pre-existing um, standardized error code that we're planning on using, which is the uh, server policy. Error, so it's failing because <coughs> of some server policy. Uh, it's very generic, and we hope to improve the user experience over time there. Um, we usually use the same error codes that are going to be problematic, likely all, with all client code. Pretty yeah, you won't be able to differentiate. There's a, there's a standardized behavior for this was This was MIT's recommendation to us. Okay. So uh, that, that's currently the plan right now, and then uh, once we get things landed, we can work on. So yeah. talk about the second part. Yeah, so, so the second part is where uh, we would actually pass through those authenticators through the tickets all the way to the end services so that end services can inspect the tickets and make the determination themselves. Right? So there's a centralized way of doing this policy and there's a decentralized way of doing the policy. And we plan to implement both of those. Uh, we also uh, are planning, uh, based on some conversations we, we had just last night, uh, about doing things like bridging this using Ypsilon into other places like SAML. Uh, so one of the things that we talked about last night was using indicators to transition into level of assurance policies uh, in SAML through Ypsilon. So this is, this is work that's all actively ongoing. Uh, and the, the core feature here is landed in upstream. Kerberos will be in Fedora 23. And, uh, and then we're doing all the sort of ecosystem polishing stuff uh, on the design Do you have a question? Yeah, it's, uh, are there plans to expose this to the Azure API? There are plans, but we have not designed it yet. So, yes. <coughs> Another problem, just back to your point. So, uh, the starting idea is call an error code, probably bad user experience for, for the services that fail, that just display the policy fails because you are not allowed to that with the service. So, and it would have to be communicated out of that, and that in this case, you have the notes or the notes form you have in that experience. The next step is, okay, make the services smarter and selectively say, okay, for this service, we are going to now send these indicators because this service knows how to handle it. So then, through the GSS API that has been discussed 30 seconds ago, 
<laughs> the service will be able to pull this indicator and say, ah, oh, okay, yep. this ticket uh, is uh, acquired without OTP and I acquire OTP, so I'm going to redirect whatever my default authentication URL to go and authenticate there. So that would be per service. Yeah. There's, a, there's another aspect to the service side when you're doing the decentralized verification of indicators uh, is that you can have lots of granularity. So you can say, let's say you have uh, some file sharing over HTTP service and you use Kerberos to log into it and uh, you're browsing through your files and everything's fine, but then you get to a secure directory. And at that point it would say, I'm sorry, you don't have permissions because you don't have uh, two-factor authentication. So you can actually, uh, in a centralized model, Everything is uh, less granular. You only get per service policy. Uh, but when you actually then break it out into the decentralized model, you can actually have it for specific resources within the service. And that's where we would need more buy-in on Kerberos in the way services to adopt this model. Yeah, and for services that are already doing something similar, like if a, if a service is already depending on something like standardized levels of assurance, if we can transition <coughs> those uh, at a transition point like Ypsilon, uh, then that allows us to, to have a pretty smooth experience there as well. Yeah. Uh, you might also be worth talking to the uh, policy people for the first week or so. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of people are saying you still don't have to take the policy for a uh, restoration. Mm -hmm. So we want to talk about that in those versions. Um, that's, a good, uh, that's a good recommendation. Are there policy good people here? Good. We should talk. Uh, so that's that's basically the overview of authentication indicators. It's been a, a long work uh, that, that just landed recently, so uh, we hope to move forward with that. Uh, we also have HTTP proxy discovery. Uh, we had this required a new internet draft, which, which I wrote with SEMA. And uh, this basically allows us to also discover the proxy. Uh, not Right now you can discover uh, the KDC, so if you type in your, your principal and log in, it will go find the KDC and then attempt to do your authentication. Uh, we want to also be able to discover the, the proxy uh, so, that, so that all of that is completely ubiquitous, uh, which is our plan here. How is the standardization of organic authenticators progressing currently? Um, it, uh, it, it was finalized and it was about to be done for last call, and they realized that there was some wording that needed to be updated. Uh, Tom just submitted that wording probably about three weeks ago. And so, give it another month, it'll probably go for last call. Okay. I know the um, whole get the hunters on the files in the draft. It is, yeah, it, that's, I just need to update it. Uh, that's a task in my book. Okay. Yeah, so, comments about that, and you are familiar with Hammer Stack, right? So, that was something that had been done by Microsoft, mm -hmm. so I'm guessing that goes well. As, as a result, uh, MIT is very particular about making sure that. So there were actually two layers of standards. One is HANA giving you a container to send all this information around, and then that's signed. <coughs> yeah, that's signed. Yeah, and then authenticator is actually a flavor of the authentication information that is carried inside the container. So you can put other generic information in there as well, uh, but authenticators is is just one of the types. Let's, let's move on, unless anybody has more questions here. So our next big project, uh, which I actually just finished up some of the preparatory work for, is Password Authenticated Key Exchange. Uh, this is a, uh, a new pre-authentication mechanism for, um, for Kerberos. Kerberos has these ideas uh, called the pre-authentication mechanisms. It's basically the ways that you prove who you are. Well, uh, the traditional way to do this uh, has been encrypted timestamp. And that basically means you take your password, you take the timestamp, you encrypt the timestamp and the password, and you send it to the server. Uh, the server then it decrypts the timestamp and matches that it validates against the local time that it's you know, within a certain window. Uh, that had the time synchronization problems that we talked about. Uh, other people have also implemented other uh, pre authentication mechanisms. Most of them are centered around the question of multi factors. Uh, and this led to the creation of something called FAST, uh, which is a something essentially, uh, to boil it down very simply, probably too simply, uh, is SSL for Kerberos, uh, which allows you to send credentials uh, to Kerberos through this encrypted tunnel. Well, now, of course, you've actually 
Uh, fast is a good thing for a variety of cases, particularly because it allows you to encrypt the entire ticket so that no information about the ticket is shown over the wire, which is a nice thing. So fast is not bad, uh, but it does sort of uh, fall into the trap of sending passwords into clear through its encrypted channel, which we don't want to do. Uh, we also have the concern of how to accurately handle multi-factor authentication. When we implemented uh, the OTP support, we did it using uh, a standard that was created by RSA, and uh, although we implemented it and it works well, we, we realized that there were some some design flaws with it fairly early on, particularly as regards user experience. Setting up the fast tunnel is, um, in a system like FreeIPA, where you have a control over the clients and the servers, uh, all of this can work very well, very integrated, uh, but if you want to try to do it in a completely configless environment, such as with Fedora volunteers, let's say, um, it, it's not really uh, easy to deploy in that situation. So what we've done is we've, we've used uh, strong modern cryptography, including elliptic curves, uh, to implement a new pre-auth uh, pre mechanism. And it's called Password Authenticated Key Exchange. And the way this works is, does everybody know what a Diffie-Hellman key exchange is? So a Diffie-Hellman key exchange is a simple mathematical operation. Uh, each side gets to share a public key, and then it derives a session key, and each other can't, uh, can't determine what the session key is. Uh, password authenticated key exchange is the same thing, uh, but using a password uh, mixed into that algorithm in some way. There's various different ways to do it, uh, but you mix in a password into that algorithm, and the end result is that uh, only if both sides know the password does the session key actually calculate out correctly. And so we use this in order to have no password on the wire again, just like the encrypted timestamp. But notice that there's no timestamp involved at all. Uh, so we're before, if you had a time, time synchronization issue, you'd get a failure, and then you could flip it back uh, with a, an offset. Now we can just do this in one exchange, no time synchronization is required at all. Uh, no offline dictionary attacks are possible at all. So one of the difficult problems with encrypted timestamp is that because you're encrypting a timestamp, which is a known value, in your password, uh, anyone who eavesdrops the encrypted packet that's sent can perform an offline dictionary attack against your password against that packet. And if they get back a timestamp value that looks correct, then they've probably guessed your password. Uh, PIC does not allow for this, uh, which is a, a big win for us. Uh, it also means that we don't have to have any third party trust. So the idea of having a fast tunnel uh, goes away, at least for the case that we care about, uh, which is sending multi factor uh, authentication. And, and PIC permits us to actually encrypt a second factor in the same packet that's sent to validate the first factor. So we perform this key exchange, and then we send a validator to prove that we know the first factor. But at the same time, we also send a, uh, the second factor in an encrypted packet at the same time. We hand those both to the server, and the server will say yes or no. And so you don't know which factor succeeded or failed. Uh, which is exactly the property we want. Everything's done in encryption, and there's no third-party trust required. So you don't have to set up a fast tunnel, you don't have to do anything. It's a really great user experience. Um, <clears throat> we actually had a proof of concept that was done here. Don't use it, it's insecure. It says that on the website. Uh, it was just a, a proof of concept to see if we could actually make it work. Uh, and there's, we still needed uh, some various security features. So don't use it, it's insecure, but uh, we did have a proof of concept. Uh, we then, uh, our current state is that we have uh, published an internet draft for this, so it's going to be standardized. We have also uh, landed in Kerberos all the preparatory work that we needed uh, to, to actually implement this. So there were various, what's that? Oh, when you say in Kerberos, you mean in MIT? In MIT Kerberos, yep. <clears throat> so in MIT Kerberos, there were, in their code base, there were some things we needed to tweak so that we can implement this as a plugin. And our plan now is to go implement it as the plugin, and then eventually, once it's all working, we'll actually ship it in the upstream MIT distribution. So, uh, so this is very exciting, uh, along with the authenticators. And these, this is the the kind of uh, twin hands, if you will, of the of our future Kerberos approach. And this will provide a really good user experience uh, for uh, multi-factor authentication because we've we've now defined a generic mechanism for doing multi-factor authentication rather than every multi-factor person doing their own uh, pre-auth mechanism. Uh, so that will be beneficial as well. Uh, we would really like some improved browser support. 
Uh, so <laughs> this, is, this is one of the things we've started to look at. Uh, we have no concrete plans here, but we would really like your help. Uh, we don't have a browser person on our team, so if you know a browser person who's looking for a fun side project, uh, we would definitely like some help here. And the, the simple idea is that uh, when browsers first implemented Kerberos, uh, they did so based upon the assumptions of the past. Remember that first side with, with a lot of the downsides? Uh, so browsers basically had all those same assumptions of all the stuff that we've done in the past, and that was how they built their support. But we've done a lot of stuff since then, and so the experience in browsers could be much more polished today than it could yesterday. And so we would like to bring that same level of polish and refinement to the browser experience. But we don't have a browser guy. So if you have a browser guy and he wants to work on this, please send him our way. We'd be glad to give him work. Do you think it's ever possible, or it will ever be possible, for browsers to ship with this enabled by default? Yes, Absolutely. they do now. We, uh, so because the last, the last time you have to configure it, yeah, right? right? Because so the presumption is you're, right. you need client configuration. Right. The last I recall was that there was a setting and you had to enable it to send existing principles for certain domain. That's correct. But it basically took every principle you had and threw them at the server and hoped that one worked. That's correct. Which yep. was actually a disclosure vulnerability, yes. and so nobody turns it on. Yes. Um, there, are, there are definitely ways around this. One of the nice things about PIG uh, is that there is absolutely no benefit to a rogue server gaming an authentication packet, which is something we've never had before, uh, because before you could, if you received the packet, you could do an offline dictionary attack, for instance, against the password. Uh, but once we have PIG landed, you can send authentication packets all, you, all day long to whatever server you want, and they can't gain any information unless they already know the password, which is what they're trying to get anyway. So, uh, so yeah, so the, the answer is basically all of this polished stuff that we've been doing under the covers just now needs to be brought into the user experience of the browser. So, returning <coughs> to our first slide, uh, you, you see we've actually gained, uh, we've gained some upsides here. Uh, we have the dictionary attack problem that we've identified and we've solved with PIG. We have the one-time password support, and with authenticators, we're going to get per-service policy uh, on that, and we've eliminated all the downsides. So the basic plan here, if, if you can't guess what we're doing with this slide, go deploy Kerberos. It's a much better environment today than it used to be, and there's lots of great tools like Free IPA, uh, which is, by the way, part of our uh, server product in Fedora. So, uh, so it's definitely something uh, you know, we want to encourage you to use. So I'm, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robbie. So Nathaniel has talked um, about in a more abstract um, what what e what we have for the past and future Kerberos, but what we haven't really covered is how do you get this. Um, that's what I want to talk a little bit about. So to quickly recap, um, Kerberos, right? It's client server. Uh, you need some servers. Uh, we call that a KDC. And as Nathaniel mentioned, it's kind of a pain to deploy if you try and do it by hand and haven't just, done just it before. Just VPN, because you turn it on, you uninstall, and you're done. You've got to be gone, man. <laughs> Assuming you don't have an existing infrastructure. Right. Infrastructure is infrastructure. And at the present day, um, the clients need to know some stuff about the servers. We have good heuristics for guessing that. Um, you mentioned pulling the server from the realm name when you do a K in it. Um, and things like that. But really, what you need is um, something that stands all that up for you, and that's FreeIPA. So FreeIPA um, is a push-button solution in the sense that you run one command and it goes, and it gives you all of the things you could want. You have your Realm, you have your nice interface, you have a powerful API. Um, you have you, you know, master replication. Everything else that makes it look like yep. AD, essentially. Um, and the magic behind all of that, and you don't, so if you want to have a client, yes, thank you. Um, you, you can run IPA client install, but you can also use only parts of the realm, um, and you can do that with SSSD. So for instance, the way this laptop is set up, I'm not a client in the realm, but I can take advantage of a lot of the realm features by using SSSD and pulling my login information from there, for instance. The system security services daemon? Security services, 
That is the back of the book. What was the book? That's a story I'll tell later. Most people who are behind that are you. Know, <laughs> and I'm sorry, but I wish SSSD would take over more because it's the thing that seems to always work. Well, it's in Debian now. Oh. Yes. Yeah, it's in Debian now. now. What's that? It's in BSD yeah. now. Put it in BSD. So now Yahoo oh, can really? use it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the first um, way you can get in as a client application developer into using all of this great stuff, you know, your free IPA realm, your KDC, your Kerberos, you're excited, uh, is GSS API. And we alluded earlier there had been some um, incompatibilities between Kerberos implementations. And the GSS API helps to fix a lot of that. You know, it's a standardized API, it's got RFCs. Um, what do we have up there? Three of them. Um, and it'll even do Microsoft if you really want it. Um, but it, it's not just Kerberos is the thing. It, it has other mechanisms as well. Uh, for my purposes, I'm mostly concerned with Kerberos, but if you want to do other things, you can use Spinego and whatnot. And it's a relatively simple API. Um, there's five functions you really need to care about. Um, import name, grab your username. Init set context is um, how you begin as the first party in an exchange. Accept set context is the second party. So you want to think client, server. Uh, and then wrap and unwrap are for your encryption, which you're going to do, right? Do your encryption. GSS API can also do encryption. It doesn't do just up so you can authenticate and then also do encryption. Yeah, and I'm emphasizing those two in particular because there are a number of applications in the wild that, you know, they get the first three right and it's amazing and it looks to all the world like Kerberos is being used uh, fully and you get there and there's no encryption. So yes, you've done all this authentication, but it counts for very little and at that point. TLS. Yeah. <laughs> when all they had to do was call two functions. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank question. you. Post. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Is there a proper documentation for GSS API? Yes. Right. Yes. It's uh, RFC 2743 and 2744. 2744 yeah. is... Looking for a you have to. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, MIT uh, did a good job on cleaning the uh, APIs and putting documentation on the documentation portal. So I have seen the efforts around that a couple of years ago, they were very different. So I suspect you will find a lot of guidance there now. And Simo here is, is here as well, and he's the GSS expert in the room. So uh, you can find him and ask him any questions you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still find a lot of this to be pretty deep wizard stuff anyway, but if you, you know, yeah. it's still not easy. <coughs> It's getting better. Yeah, it's, it's a getting lot better. better. It's getting yeah. a lot better. That's the most wizard <laughs> <laughs> RFCs can be a little intimidating, but 2744 really does cover a lot of what you need to know in order to actually use this. And yes, there are other functions in there besides these five, but these are the five that you really need to get started. Don't, don't, don't use Modoc. There's Modoc's an answer to that. Don't use Modoc. Use Modoc GSS API. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have been switching from So another way of calling into all of this Kerberos magic um, is SASL, which is also standardized, though I like the RFC rather less. Um, though it does have more mechanism support out of the box, 
and it's easier to extend. Um, you drop a line in a config file and add a .so, and it takes care of it. Um, it also has support for protocol uh, um, support. So w when you have a protocol that maybe has a built-in security layer, say you um, connect SSL to a server and then you go into SASL, uh, you can t inform SASL that you have done this and that the security is there from that, uh, which is something that you can't do with GSS API. And yes, the protocol does also allow for authentication without encryption, which is kind of unfortunate, but I can't win everything. So SASL is a bit more verbose. Um, there are a bunch more functions. We've got my two crypto functions at the bottom here. Uh, that's the goal state, uh, is to get to encode and decode. Um, but the way the API works is a bit more, um, you request something from the library and the library says, okay, well, you didn't give me enough information, and then it gives you back a struct, and you go fill in the fields in the struct, and then you hand it back in. It's very um, object-oriented. Notice that the API with the word simple in the title is actually more complex. Yes. <laughs> so, Sassel, what does Sassel stand for? Simple C authentication and security, security, security layer. Yeah, it's not simple. Uh, I, I think it's, it's simple in, uh, in comparison yeah, probably. <laughs> okay, so to recap, um, SASL is more powerful, um, but it is a little bit harder to use. Uh, this is in part because GSS API is a mechanism you can use with SASL, so it subsumes everything. Um, and Don't take away from this slide that you should always use SASL. You should judge on a case by case basis. Absolutely. What your needs are. So because this is a Fedora conference, um, we should talk about what the state of using this in Fedora is. Um, so the, the default way of doing this, because uh, these are C APIs for C and C++, you know, you call into your uh, libraries, libsassl, libgss API. Um, and the same is true for Go, um, if you're a Go person. And Haskell as well, though that's not ideal. Um, uh, okay. For some others, we have packaging. Um, the packaging for GSS API is a bit stronger than the packaging for SASL at the moment. Uh, Python and Ruby sort of hurt a little bit here. Um, and Rust and Erlang are forthcoming, but... There's a huge one missing. No Perl on there. Sully, you want to tell us about Perl? <laughs> I, I didn't say I like it. I, I, you know, I, I'm sorry to say I actually have looked into the state of GSS API. I assume it's there though because it's Perl. <laughs> <laughs> Perl is an FFI, right? <laughs> Perl is an FFI, right? Yes. Well, there, yeah. there is a there is well, a well there is yeah. a way to write native bindings somewhat like there is for Python, uh, except you don't have to deal with uh, some of the weird stuff in Python. Perl. Anyway. On a personal level, I'm not sure I want to encourage the proliferation of additional Perl, but yeah. that's <laughs> me and not. <laughs> Other, other people but like there Carl. There are certain things that already exist that are written in it. Absolutely. We also want to strongly suggest that you do not attempt to re-implement any of these things in native languages. You should, you should you definitely use language. bindings because this is a very difficult to get the security correct. And these are very mature. LibGSS API and Cyrus Sassel are very mature implementations of long histories. Although Java does a lot of this stuff on its own. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and and it's one of the reasons why Java kind of lives in its own universe uh, because they also implement Kerberos related stuff, GSS API and others, uh, but it's not the same experience you get in other places. The API is different because of course it is. Yeah. Java has its own RFC. Yes, it does. Did you have a question? So does the Python binding support Python? Yes. yes, we absolutely support <laughs> Python 3 with that. We encourage Python 3 to do it. We have both Python 2 and Python 3. We've tested up to Python 3.4, and we test Python 3.3 and 3.4, as well as 2.7. Do we know when 3.5 is coming? Soon, right? It's all the soon. It's in the future. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about that yet. Okay. So. Uh, oh. Well, in, that case, in that case, I should add it to my task matrix. 
Mm. We can talk about that. <laughs> it's not a good rule. So, as an application developer, you probably don't want to go alone into the night using all of these amazing new technologies that no one else is using. You'd like to see um, some other applications using them already. So, here are some. Um, if you, you know, do email in a desktop client, you've seen IMAP, SMTP, those can both do Kerberos. In a lot of enterprise environments, they will, um, but this is often opaque and not by default. Uh, IRC, XMPP, they do SASL. Um, Freenode, in particular, uh, supports SASL for authentication, and if you're someone who has ever tried to connect to Freenode over Tor, you know how exciting that is to set up. Um, so. The user experience there is a little bit lacking, but it's at least there. Um, cups, if you wanted to K in it in order to print, you can do that. And your system log, though I guess Fedora isn't using this as the main log, you can still consume uh, our syslog for pieces, and that will do Kerberized um, tunneling for log aggregation through the GSS API. And SSH, um, this is the one that we like to show off because it's the clearest is you know you K in it and you SSH to the host and it doesn't prompt you for the password because it uses GSS API for your authentication. It does have its own issues. It has its own issues, but it mostly works. Um, we've also got some databases. This is stuff that I've been working on recently and is in the process of being merged upstream. But if you ever wanted to talk GSS API to your database, you can do that too. Um, and in tandem with that, for messaging, uh, Cupid Proton will support SASL, uh, sorry, sorry, already support SASL as of release 0 0.1, I think. And w the goal with both of those is to have a fully Kerberized OpenStack, um, if you desire that. We're not quite there yet, but that's a lot of the work. Um, GSS proxy also bears mentioning uh, for adding additional privilege separation on top of the way credential handling works. So if you as a sysadmin uh, maybe don't want your service to have access to all of the possible credentials it could need and maybe do access control on that, you can spin up the GSS proxy and GSS proxy will allow for that uh, layer. Um, unfortunately, Simo's not here. That's his project. Yeah, Simo. Yeah. So the value of that is if you have a network facing service, It, it's, it's a separate, yeah, it's yeah. A, it's it's a separate, a separate process. process which contains all of the keys that could be used and if, you're, if the process that's doing authentication and encryption is compromised, they can't access the keys. Assuming they don't access everything. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you do that, you're kind of sunk yeah. anyway. Um, as we mentioned, um, Monolith GSS API for Apache instead of Monolith Curb. Um, and yes, we would like some help on the browser UX. It's there, it's not great. Um, yeah, so one last one we didn't want to talk about is the work we've done. Uh, we actually, uh, another guy who's not here, uh, Nikos, uh, wrote some uh, integration for OpenConnect VPN. And this is actually a really fascinating integration because it uses the proxy support, uh, which actually allows you to proxy the Kerberos requests through the VPN server to your KDC to get back a ticket, and then you can wow. use the ticket to log into the VPN. Okay, so what, it, what this means is that you actually have a single sign-on experience even outside the infrastructure. You can get your Kerberos ticket, sign into the VPN, do all of your stuff now with one single logout. And we're working on trying to figure out how to uh, make that work in the desktop environment uh, in conjunction with SSSD so that you can log in with this SSD, get your ticket automatically, and automatically connect to the VPN. That works with the HTTPS stuff, right? So yeah, so the, the, the reason that this support was able to come, come in so quickly was because um, this is an SSL VPN, and it all uses HTTPS, uh, and we already have the Spinango mechanism for doing Kerberos, so they just added support for that, and then they added support for proxying the Kerberos packets. So it's a really smooth little environment, uh, and it bears playing with. Okay, um, that's it for our content. Uh, any questions we didn't get to? Go for it. Okay, so let's say if I have an application that's actually calling a server and calls the server is in the mesh server, uh, if I want to implement some client with my SS inset and I want to like uh, authenticate, so should I, should I use GSS API, SASL, or something else? 
if you're interested in just Kerberos, um, GSS API is probably the easiest to go with, um, but there are additional considerations uh, for interop in the future that may cause you to go one way or the other. Both will work. If you need also, if you need more Kerberos specific fiddly bits, um, to use the technical term, <laughs> GSS API will offer you a few more fiddly bits, um, and the, there's also a bunch of GSS API extensions that further expose more stuff. Whereas and uh, more um, Sassel was is more of a generic, like okay, I have a list of mechanisms that I support. You know, it may be GSS API. Like I may support GSS API. I may support you know passwords uh, for some reason, and and then the server might support only one of those, and it's going to negotiation there. Um, well, uh, it probably depends on the protocol that you know, inside. So the more interoperable the protocol needs to be, the higher it needs to go. So that would probably be the one you to find with all sorts of different implementations. On the server side. If you are pretty sure that there will be no, not much interoperability, and it is just your client and just your server, then GSS API is probably the best. To address your specific use case, um, for GSS API with a key tab, you can uh, either call a specific function for acquiring credentials with a key tab, or uh, set an environment variable. Um, and then for SASL, you would, I believe, add a line to the SASL config file, and it would pick it up. We're actually out of time, uh, but if you have questions, we'll stand in the back and come ask them. Thank you, everyone.